Yes. So, your book fell into my lap in about 15 years ago. I was in the Arizona Department of Corrections for importing ecstasy, serving a nine and a half year sentence. I oh my work- God. I had a workout partner called Iron Man, martial arts guy. Yeah. And he, he, he came in my cell one day, put this on my lap, and he said, you got to read this. And I was reading about 10 different books on rotation because I was reading all day long. And I get bored of one, move on to the other, move on to the other. But every now and then, there was one I had to stop by rotation. And I, there was just one I could not put down. And yours was absolutely mesmerizing. Are you aware that all of your books are banned by the Arizona Department of Corrections? I don't think all of them are banned. I think the 48 laws of power is banned. And I think the strategies of war, I haven't heard that the other books have been banned, but I'm aware that they're banned in Utah and Pennsylvania. But you're the first person I've talked to who is, well, no, the second person I've talked to in the prison system who's actually can explain to me why the books are so popular in prisons. I have an idea, but you can give me a better idea. Okay, I would say various reasons then. And I imagine that the books you've written since I was in prison, perhaps they are not banned, that's correct. So when it comes to 48 Laws of Power then, I mean, the dynamics in prison are the same as the dynamics in high school. It's like people playing mind games, but in prison it's taken to the deadly consequence level. I think it was Timothy Leary wrote, he saw parallels in the business community in the jail community in the in the student community etc so when you've got people playing all these mind games on you and you read the 48 laws for me when i read it not just all the mind games that have been played on me in prison but all of the tricks that have been pulled on me on my entire life i was like holy shit that person did that thing to me that person did that thing to me and I realized from, you know, how you'd educated the world through these books, there are ways to counteract these strategies. But if you can't identify what's happening to you, it's all over. Well, uh, you know, I get that question asked a lot of time. Are you aware that your books are banned in prison? And usually the implication is, sorry, sorry. It's okay. You're okay. I got it. Um and usually it's with a connotation that my book is evil why else would people in prison be reading it and i've always had the impression as i said you're the second person i talked to that it's mostly used for defense for people who enter the prison system who are shocked by it who are not used to it and they're all kinds of, and the mind games are not just the other prisoners but i've heard also from wardens and guards etc that the book is mostly to help them deal with all of these intense, almost deadly power games. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And, okay. you know, it's, it's a powder keg. You could be walking down a corridor. Someone could say to you, why are you looking at me? You look back uh-huh. at them and said, I was looking at nothing. He says, who are you calling nothing? And next thing it's on. So to have to be armed with the 48 laws of power to help you navigate um, gives you an aura of confidence and safety. What would you What would you have done? What did you do in that situation? Did you not answer? I mean, what would be the law of power that you would apply when someone does, says that to you? So, in a in a split second situation mm-hmm. like that, I would have become. I would have tried to become diplomatic and courteous rather than you know, my energy rise to the confrontational level to try and uh-huh. de-escalate the situation. I see. That's very smart. I would advise that as well. It's very interesting. I mean, look at my, I've got piano playing hands. I'm not a fighter. So for me, yeah, I yeah. have to use the more cerebral strategies and be more um, courteous, na- navigate my way through it courteously. But I did have, uh, a, a, my best friend from childhood was in the prison and um, he was a why, massive... why was that? I had over 100 co defendants, so I was importing ecstasy and throwing rave parties. Uh-huh. Um, wild man, my best friend from childhood, he died last year, six Sorry. foot two, um, 
massive guy. And when he arrived at one of the prisons, they asked him, you know, what are your charges? He says, I've just been sentenced. I've, I've had a long day. Piss off, basically. And said, no, you can't tell us to piss off. You've got to show us your charges or else, you know, you're going to get done in. He just knocked the guy out. That was his strategy. Then they I said, see. then they said to him, you don't know what you just did. We're going to come back. They came back and offered him the guy's job. So that strategy really? worked for him. <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't have worked for you. No. You've got, pia- you've got piano hands. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. So That's great. before... Um, well, before... Do you mind if I do? We do you mind if I use your story in my subsequent interviews? Because I, I have to. I, it's a very good answer that I could use. Oh do my! I have goodness. your permission. I I would be honored. And I, okay, I messaged, I messaged Iron Man uh, before I came on. I've not spoken to him in several months to see just to tell him and ask him if he's got any questions for you. But he's not responded yet. But I've got the window open okay. over here. Okay. Okay. Uh, when when I send him this interview, he's going to be absolutely mind blown. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. um, so before incarceration, then I was a stock market guy. Before the XC raise, I was a stock market guy. I never really read much other than finance books. And then, as soon as I got incarcerated, I went, I went on this fantastic journey through literature. And that's how I dis- discovered the Stoics, read a lot of philosophy and psychology. So, yeah. reading people like Epictetus, then, Robert, do you believe that suffering can provide a good form of education? Well, most definitely. I mean, if everything went well in life, we humans would be absolutely the most the most evil, worst creatures of all, because it would all go to our heads. We would think that we were gods. It's through failure, through suffering, through pain that we gain a degree of humility and that we learn about our own limitations, right? So, you know, if you have continual success, You get this idea that no matter what you do, it's great, it's golden, right? You've got the golden touch. And then you're going to suffer a very, very hard fall, and it's going to be extremely painful because life is inherently difficult, harsh, and competitive, particularly in the modern world. And so through failure, you learn about, you know, your own limitations, your own mistakes, who you are, what you can improve, what needs work, etc. I had... um, I can talk about one of my own recent failures and what it taught me. Um, I was working on a book with the rapper 50 Cent back in 2006, more or less, 2007. And we were kind of co-authors on this book. And the first version of the book was very much about 50 and his business approach, et cetera. And the publishers didn't really like it. I must admit it wasn't my best writing. And they basically canceled the project, which was very potentially very humiliating for me and could have been a very bad blow for my career. And I wasn't used to failing like that because my my writing, my books had always been successful. And so I learned a valuable lesson from that. I learned that what I was being too deferential to 50 Cent. I was making him the star of the show. And I learned that I have to be able to impose myself, that I have a fan base, that I have to not be so deferential, so accommodating. I had to make the book more about me or at least about both of us. And it was very painful because, as I said, it could have been a big blow to my career, but it was also a blow to my ego. And furthermore, I we managed to resell the book with a new concept that I came up with. But the new publisher said, Robert, you have eight months to write this book. And it takes me years to write books like that. And I said, there's no way I could do a book in eight months, but I did. So that was one of the most recent and very powerfully painful experiences. Of course, I had a near-death experience about three years ago, which is a lot worse. I won't go into that right now. But, you know, it's through these things that I've learned a lot about myself and I've been able to kind of up my game, so to speak. Yeah, and going back to that question about suffering then, what did the near-death experience teach you? Well, I had a stroke um, a little over three years ago, and I came this close to dying. My my wife was in the car, and I was driving here in Los Angeles, and she forced me to pull over, so I could have easily gotten into a horrible accident. But I was unconscious, and I was in a coma, and I suffered brain damage, which I'm still dealing with. I can't really walk very well. But... 
basically it's taught me that I have to change a lot of my personality. I've had to adapt. I'm a very somewhat aggressive person. I'm very impatient. So if I'm in doing sports of any sort, I know that by constant, you know, application and exercise, I will improve and I'll become really good at it. And I do that for swimming, for bicycling. Now I can't swim. I can barely walk. I can't hike. I can't do any of those things. So that desire to push through has been completely annihilated. I have to draw upon other qualities, other strengths in my character that I never had before. I have to learn to be incredibly patient and incredibly easy on myself because I've been, this is over three years ago and I've made progress, but the progress is so slow. You can't believe that it takes me several minutes to tie my shoes, to put on a shirt. These are things that you just take for granted. So it's taught me a lot about some of my own weaknesses. And the second thing it's taught me is to appreciate the small things around me, to appreciate the fact that I'm fucking alive, you know? I could have easily been dead, right? So when I look out the window and I see things, you know, the world has a different look to it for me right now. It has an intensity that didn't have before because I took so much for granted. But I can tell you, I've never been through an experience that caused so much suffering as the stroke because it took away so many of the pleasures that I had in life. Do you think all this research you've done into the Stoics kind of prepared you mentally? It's kind of insulated you a little bit. It could have been much worse mentally if you hadn't done all that research. I think so. And the books by their nature, you know, Laws of Human Nature, my last book, took me five years to write. And that requires a, a lot of discipline and a lot of patience, right? So I did have something within me, some resources to draw upon. And also I've learned to kind of over the years to sort of detach myself from my own emotional reactions, to look at myself from a distance and to analyze myself. You know, I, if I could say like the theme of all of my books and the theme of the daily laws, the supreme power you can have in life is the ability to observe yourself, right? If you can observe yourself, then you can also observe other people as well. But what happens is we get so caught up in daily actions, we're so in, enmeshed in the immediate present and our stream of consciousness and people saying this and doing that, that we have no distance. So my books and, and my practice of meditation has taught me to stand back. I, I have an analogy when I'm meditating where it, it's like four inches away I'm looking at myself from four inches away. That's the best I can do sometimes. And from that distance, I see my, my emotions and I go, no, let's analyze that. Let's not react, right? Sometimes I can make it six inches. Sometimes it's one sixteenth of an inch and I can't do it. It's weird how this happens, but it's a skill that I've developed over the years and has certainly, certainly helped me deal with this crisis. Yeah, so I wrote a book called Life Lessons, and one of the uh -huh. lessons is take time. Based, for based on your based on your prison experience. Yeah, it's the ten most important lessons uh, I learned while reflecting. I want to read that. Prison. Yeah, I, I will absolutely get you a copy. So, like you just said, we're zooming through life. We're not taking time out for introspection. And once I had all that time on my hands, I completely reviewed my life, saw you know my mistakes, and it was part of my journey to go deep inside myself and address the root causes of why I got into crime. Now, once you get out of prison, you resolve to maintain your meditation and your introspection. But of course, technology and life, you, you know, five years later, you're Zooming again. Last month, I got the virus. I was in bed oh. for two weeks. Yeah, for two oh, weeks. That's why, we had, that's why we had to cancel the first time. Yes, yes, yes. And oh, for I'm being so in sorry. Bed, it's okay because I, I appreciate, even though I couldn't eat for two weeks and I lost a lot of weight, I appreciate it because it reminded me of the pledge I made when I got out of prison to take time for introspection. I was forced for two weeks just to, just to be in bed and to start reflecting and meditating about right. everything in life. And I think um, people, it, it's hard to maintain the discipline to do that. It's very difficult. You know, um... I read recently from a, a famous psychologist, yeah, American named William James, that we are creatures of habit. It's how our brains operate, right? And most of the habits are negative, right? They deal with addictions. 
and I don't mean just drug addictions. I mean daily addictions, like addictions to technology, addictions to pornography, addictions to bad relationships. We become prisoners of these patterns in our life that we can't control, and they become habits that basically take us over. It's almost like we're invaded by some alien creature, and we have no more control over ourselves. But because the brain operates by this compulsive habitual um, process, you can turn that around. You can make habits a positive thing. So this ability to distance yourself, to observe yourself, is useless unless you practice it every single day, unless you, you know, you work out, you, you lift weights, you, you run, and you do that every day to make your muscles stronger. And if you miss a week, you feel terrible. You need to do the same thing with yourself, with your brain, with how you look at yourself. So if you did this once every two weeks, it wouldn't have any value to it. Because that distance I was talking about will shrink to nothing and you'll be just trapped in the present. Every day you practice it a little bit and it starts sinking in, it gets under your skin and it becomes a habit. And it becomes a positive habit that completely reverses all those negative patterns in your life. And so the daily laws is designed to kind of immerse you every single day in that practice of observing yourself and observing the toxic people around you and observing the culture that you live in. So, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to move over to toxic people in a second then. So we started out this conversation where I just gave you those early prison stories. Wild man crushed his enemy completely versus I was uh, <laughs> going more, I would be more political. Um, but what, what, hadn't happened then this was back in uh, the early 2000s was the rise of technology to the extent that it is today so now you've got all these mind games being played by people sat behind keyboards and we don't even know who they are for example trolls online lynch mobs i mean how would you say that people could apply the laws to dealing with all of these threats online well, one of the laws in the 48 Laws of Power, I think it's around number 36, is disdain things you cannot have. Ignoring is the best revenge. So you have to learn to ignore things, right? And one of the prime lessons you need to ignore is spend less t damn time on that stupid social media. It's rotting your brain. It's like candy. It's going <laughs> to rot your brain from the inside out. So develop some discipline and some patience and say, Instead of three hours on Instagram every day, I'll spend half an hour or whatever, right? Okay, so you need to ignore sometimes the social media, but you need to ignore people's trolling behavior because what it's about is sucking you in. It's about getting a reaction. That's how toxic people operate. They are masters at creating drama around them, right? They've been learning since they were six years old, maybe even earlier, maybe even in the crib that by crying, by making a scene, by doing all kinds of dramatic things, they get attention, they get power. And, you know, we all have to deal with these people in our daily life and the boss and the office colleagues, et cetera. But it's a little easier to deal with them when you see them face to face because to be really toxic requires a lot of balls to do it in person. You know, you people can see you, they can react against you, you might get punched in the face. But on the internet, there are no consequences, right? You're anonymous, right? So if you've got that trollish tendency, which a huge percentage of people do, and I talk about that in the laws of human nature, why that exists, why social media is your paradise, right? You could be some overweight loser guy in your apartment, in your, in your studio apartment, and on your keyboard, you turn into Napoleon Bonaparte, right? You can crush anybody, right? But nobody gets to see the fact that you're this guy who has no life, right? Who has no girlfriends, who has no power, no position, okay? So your job in life is to learn to ignore it and not get involved in these little messy battles. In the 33 Strategies of War, I talk about pick your battles carefully. Some battles are not worth it. And I had this lesson right after my stroke. The, 30, the laws of human nature came out and there was a new website on Facebook about the books of Robert Greene. And I saw some people kind of making some snide comments about my new book. And, you know, I just had a, I just nearly died. And I put all of my life into that book and I got, I got involved. I got sucked into it and I responded and I thought I felt 
terrible for it. I felt like I had, I was not the writer of the 48 laws of power, but I had shrunk in size and I learned, I'm not going to do this ever again. These battles are useless. They give you nothing in return. As I said, it's like candy, you eat it, but there's no nutrition in it. I just ignore it. Right. I don't look at my YouTube comments, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to develop the power of ignoring these things. That's the best strategy of all. Yeah, I remember when I, I saw some my first negative Amazon reviews, I was shell shocked. But um, years later, when I come to write a second edition of that book, I took heed of what some of them said and, and applied it to to make a better product. Now uh, ah. we, inter we interviewed Richard uh, Dawkins earlier, and oh. I saw he he had about seven thousand uh, reviews on Amazon UK. And then I, I looked over at yours. I think you've got about twenty six thousand. So when when you first started that's, that's to see pretty awesome, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. When you first <laughs> you. when you first started to see negative reviews come in, then did it trigger that emotional reaction that we all have? Yes, I remember the very so the book came out in October, I believe, of 1998. Uh, I know I'm I'm dating myself here, but um, and about a month or two months before it came out, the first review from, I forget the name of it, it's a, it's a publishing house that reviews all books that come out. Um, and it was a negative review. And I got, this is so irritating. I don't mind negative reviews, but it completely distorted the book. It was somebody who probably read the summaries of the laws, but never read the book. And man, it really, really royally pissed me off. As I said, I'm an, I could be an aggressive person. So I wrote a response. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I controlled my emotions. I wrote, wrote a very logical response and people really liked it, you know? So if I had reacted angrily and I got involved in a, in a pissing battle with them, it would have led to nothing. But I learned early on to control my emotions and to, to, to put it in, you know, to analyze instead of react and to show them that they had made an incredibly superficial judgment of my book. Um, but I've made it a practice over now 23 years of writing to never read my reviews, to never, I have people that I trust, my wife, my agent, Ryan Holiday, uh, Yost Elfers, people in my life who are very successful and, and I trust their opinion. They say, Robert, your book sucks. This chapter isn't good. I listen. But when Joe Schmo sitting in his loser apartment with the shades drawn, you know, in his T-shirt <laughs> and underwear, writes, Robert Greene sucks, you know, I don't I don't read it. So it's just just passes by, you know. <laughs> All right. So you, you're talking about um, choosing your battles carefully. So here in the UK, there's a lot of true crime podcasters and a battle broke out which has been deemed the podcast wars here in the uk <laughs> uh -huh. i said I, I i'm a very diplomatic person i collaborate with a lot of these guys but a lot of these guys are at war with each other and a few of them um did an attack on me now when you've got you know when you're collaborating with a who's enemy with b and you're trying to maintain independence it, it reminds me of law 20 do not commit to anyone. What would be your advice for someone in that situation? Well, tell me a little bit more. What are the stakes involved? What are the negative consequences that might happen for, for you? I need to have a little more information, a little more color here. So so um, there's, a, there's a collection of, of podcasters. It's, I'd say there's about 10 to 20 involved because it's spread involved in the podcast wars. It actually started with a guy who I helped turning on me and he recruited two other people to, oh, turn, wow. to turn on me but one of them turned on him and it all it all backfired but then it spread out to other people so it invo involves about 10 to 20 people at, at this point that, that um, i could think of at the top of my head and has it damaged you in any way have you paid yes, a price because, for this because the person that helped uh he he had much less subscribers than me. And I, I recommended him to the high heavens for several years. Jeez. Yeah. And then he, he just, bam, they called me everything under the sun for, for two hours. Uh, I was gay. I was a police informant. I had nasty charges, uh, that kind of stuff. 
And it, those videos went to 2 million people. So I got the living daylights trolled out of me. I still get lunatics to this day. And then it spreads to your family members. You know, they find out who your family members are through Facebook wow. and they, they, they send messages to them. Whoa. So I had to file a defamation lawsuit against that person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes the legal route is the only route available because when you're dealing with battles over your reputation, which is a very nebulous world, because at least in the United States, it's all about First Amendment rights. You know, it's my amendment right to be able to slander somebody else. Right. It becomes very difficult. You have no leverage over them. And so one of the strategies of war used against you, unfortunately, is for a David to take on a Goliath and make their reputation by it. I talked about a, a guy in the Italian, in Italy in the Renaissance who used that strategy against the most famous poet of the time, slandered him, and it made his reputation, and it made his fame. So you were the victim of that particular strategy. And, you know, it's very slippery to, to, to deal with because once you start fighting, you, you fight on their level, they control it, you have to get nasty, and it makes you look weak and it makes you look, but if you don't do anything, then, you know, then you're helpless and then you just let them run roughshod over you. So in situations like that, I've consulted with people, your situation sounds a little more slippery and difficult. You've got to find leverage points. You got to say, what can I do that will actually hurt this guy? That will actually kick him in the balls, wake him up and go, shit, I'm going to pay consequences for taking on Sean, right? It's what I call in the 33 strategies of war, the deterrent strategy. When there are nasty, trollish, toxic people out there, if you do nothing, if you play the Gandhi card, they're just going to walk all over you. You've got to deter them. You've got to say, taking on Sean Atwood, you're going to pay a price for this, right? And I, if I were consulting with you, we would have figured out what are the points of weakness of this particular guy who turned on you and how can we get back at him? What's going to hurt him in the long run? Reverse the strategy that he used on you. I know I'm being a little bit vague here, but I'd have to know more about the particulars. But that would be the, the, the way I would do it. So when you're dealing with people, you know, we have us in politics. We've got like the Putins of the world who, who don't play by the normal rules. And if you're all nice and sweet and you say, let's be diplomatic, let's have a conference, they're laughing. They're laughing hysterically because they don't care about the same things you care. So you have to be a little bit tough in this world sometimes in dealing with people like that. Yeah, you're precisely right because what you just described is um, for the first year after I spoke to my lawyer, I filed a defamation suit, I didn't say anything. And these enemies just conspired to put more and more videos out and proceeded to damage my reputation further but what did happen was people started to send me their criminal histories and, and and the main guy actually had a crime against a woman which i did not know about oh i'm not okay. gonna get into the details of it here because they'll, they'll get my video struck down but yeah i've got the goods on that person and if i release that exactly exactly thank you that that's exactly the right strategy i applaud you yeah so that's where that is at. All right. So the next thing is then um, law six caught attention at all costs. One guy who was involved in the podcast was recently just went balls to the wall, courting controversy at all costs. He got arrested a couple of days ago. Things just the fire just blazed out of control. I mean, wh where do you draw the line with that law? Well, first of all, you have to know, you know, people think that the 48 laws of power that, you know, they, they can just apply all of them. Right. Or, or you know, they, they have this idea that they should be applicable to every situation, but they don't know how to read because I make it very clear that each law has very specific circumstances that they're relevant to. You have to be you can't just mindlessly try something. You know, if you're working in an office where everything is very political and people are very kind of scared and intimidated and you court attention at all costs, you dress a certain way, you talk, you're gonna be in trouble, right? You have to know the environment, you have to know the world that you're in, okay? So there are dangers from courting too much attention because you can stir up a lot of envy and envy is a major theme 
in all of my books. But if you're like in the marketing realm, if you're one of these quote unquote scare quote influencers in, in this on our planet, you know, and if you're you're dealing with trying to create a name and a reputation for you, it comes down to this law that P.T. Barnum, the great American guy who created the circus and all those forms of entertainment in the 19th century. No publicity is bad publicity. So having controversy, having someone come after you, stirring up a lot of hornets can be good because it gets your name, it gets your attention. But if you go too far, yeah, you're going to maybe go past a limit and you might get arrested. You might offend. You know, we live in a cancel culture world. So you have to be very careful, even with that law. I wrote it before cancel culture, but it still would have applied even in 1998, that you have to understand the limits of the game. You have to, I have other laws like think as you like, but behave like others. So you can have all kinds of weird, interesting, radical ideas, but you better learn how to mute them when you're in public or when you're in a social realm where you're gonna pay hell for that, right? And there are other laws that apply in a similar fashion. So understand the limits of that game. It has its uses when you're starting to try and claw your way in the world and get some attention. Controversy is good, but no, there's another law about in victory, know when to stop, know when to stop and know what, you know, what the danger zone that you might be entering. So you reminded me of one of Pablo Escobar's favorite quotes though, which was envy kills more people in Colombia than cancer. <laughs> so do you think it's That's it's very one. easy to get blindsided then by your friends who are secretly envious i just got one today i'm just dealing with the 48 laws of power today i'm not going to go into too much detail about it but i had somebody who took my photograph for my last two for my laws of human nature and i paid her she's a friend i paid her for her work, what she asked. There was no contract because we're friends. I had done work for her for free. And suddenly she sees that the photograph was used for the daily laws. And she gets upset. And she says, well, you got to pay me all this money. Okay, I understand. We should have asked your permission. All right, let me give you uh, the certain amount of money, which is double what you what I paid for you originally. And let's go away. And she, yeah, okay. And now I find out she's hired a lawyer and she's asking for more money right you know and this is a friend i don't know if it's envy involved i think she's just a little bit socially inept right but um you know envy is is one of the, is like a it's like a, a a poisonous gas you don't see it but it, it certainly will affect you it could even kill you as pablo escobar so eloquently put it not that i don't want to quote pablo escobar that often but um so why is it a poisonous gas First of all, we humans are very prone to feeling envy. Our brains operate by continual comparison. Information comes in and the brain compares it to other information. As a social animal, what that means is we're continually comparing ourselves to other people. And this happens a hundred times a day, but you're not even aware of it because it occurs unconsciously. You hear that somebody had some success Inwardly, you're going, well, why didn't I have success? Maybe they didn't deserve it. Maybe they're evil or something. Maybe they came at their success and power through nefarious means, but not me. I'm an angel. Why don't I have the same thing? They must be evil. On and on and on. Through the course of a day, you're continually comparing yourself. And if you feel envy towards someone, this is the poisonous gas aspect, you never admit you know, I'm feeling envy today of my friend, of my fellow podcaster. No, you say to yourself, that man is evil. Sean got his power through very manipulative ways. He is not a good person. You justify your feelings of inferiority by blaming the other person. That now gives you license to attack them, to do all kinds of nasty things you know, to cut them at the kneecaps, whatever you want to do, whatever mafia expression you prefer, right? Because you feel justified in it and you never are aware that at the root of it is envy. So it's extremely human to feel envy. Primates, it's been shown, have have actual, and I mean, I'm talking about chimpanzees have been demonstrated to have feelings of envy. It's extremely, you know, wired into our nervous system. 
And it's extremely dangerous because nobody admits it. Nobody talks about it. How often do you hear people in social media sphere on the news or in books actually talk about how po powerful envy is in our culture? It's like our dirty little secret. We all reveal our sex lives, you know, ad infinitum or what we eat every morning on Facebook. But nobody talks about the actual reality of envy and the role that it plays in so much of human behavior. What would happen if all of these envious people then channeled that energy into getting off their asses and putting as much work into the success required to get to a point where you will be envied? Well, I mean, I, there's one thing I left out because you, you mentioned before something about friends. And the thing is, you have to understand about envy is you're more prone to, to elicit envy from your friends than you are from people who don't know you. And it's a little bit weird, but you go, they're my friend. They like me. Why would they feel envy? Why would they attack me? Well, that's very stupid. That's very ignorant of human nature. Sometimes people befriend you already feeling envy and they secretly want to destroy you because it makes them feel better. It's a very, very common pattern. But I talk about this in the laws of human nature. I have a chapter on envy itself. And I have a very dramatic story that illustrates it. And I tell people, you can't get rid of this comparison tendency. That means you're trying to be not a human being. It's in your brain. You can't get over it. But why not take that part of you and turn it around and make it something productive and positive instead of this wound, this sort of negative gnawing emotion inside of you? How do you turn it into a positive? Well, you say, I feel envy towards Sean Atwood. He's got more success than me. He's a better podcaster than I am. All right, what should I do? Should I sit there and attack him and do all these niggly things when it's in the end won't get me anywhere? Or maybe what I need to do is I need to up my game. I need to become a better podcaster than Sean Atwood. I need to get more followers. I need to learn from him. I need to say, I'm gonna use this comparing tendency to feed my competitive spirit, which is not a negative thing. People think competition and ambition is bad. I don't. I think it's a good thing. Okay, I'm not going to do anything manipulative or wrong. I'm just going to make sure that in the end, Sean Atwood eats my dust because I have more followers than him and I have made a better show, than a better podcast than him. That's how you get revenge. That's how you deal with, not revenge, that's how you deal with your envy. There are other things in there as well, like how to kind of, tamp it down a little bit, which is if there are people who are excellent, who are achieving things in life, you can feel envy, it's human, but then go do something different. Say, maybe they deserve it. Maybe there are people who are excellent. Maybe there are writers who are better than Robert Greene on this planet. Maybe Richard Dawkins is actually smarter than I am. I know he's a lot smarter than I am. I'm not going to feel envy towards Richard Dawkins, a brilliant man. I'm going to admire him. So you turn your envy into admiration. I have other strategies. I would suggest, you know, reading that chapter in the laws of human nature. But... That's brilliant. Um, law 10, infection, avoid the unhappy and the unlucky. So, you know, many of us have a natural instinct to help the downtrodden. Where do you draw the line then when it comes to law 10? Okay. People misunderstand this law. Yes, there are people who have suffered in life, who are truly the victims, who have been oppressed. They deserve our sympathy. They deserve our empathy. They deserve our compassion. And they deserve our help. But you have to distinguish between people like that. And I'd say most of the people who've suffered are in that category from the other infecting types who might be 5% of the population. I'm just pulling that number out of anywhere. But, And so how do you recognize the difference? Well, people, there are people in this world, you have to understand, who draw drama into their lives, who draw problems in it because they like it. They seriously feel that it gives them attention. If no one is paying attention to their games and to the, all that, they feel miserable. So what they want to do is they want to create all this dust and drama and tumult around them. That's how they survive. And in the course of that, they're going to make a lot of enemies. They're going to piss people off. People are going to do nasty things to them. And what's the first thing they do? Oh, this person, they're at fault. You know, I, woe is me. You know, I'm, I'm so innocent. I've suffered so much. 
from all these other, I'm the victim, right? You need to look at their past. So if people have been in 12 different relationships before you met them, and each of the prior relationships, let's say it's a man talking about a woman, they were all so evil. This bitch, she did this to me. This other one did that to me. Well, maybe take a step back and go, maybe he's the problem. Maybe he's creating the patterns. Maybe he's the one that start making them react in hostile ways by his own aggressive behavior. So you can recognize the difference between the truly innocent victims of this world who deserve all of our help and compassion from the other type by examining their past, by examining their patterns, and by seeing the, the toxic nature and the, and the games they're playing where they're always blaming other people, but you get a sense, maybe there's something wrong here. Maybe they're to blame for it and do a little digging. And then I think you'll be able to distinguish the difference between the two. Would you classify that as an addiction to drama? Most definitely. So, you know, as I said, going back to childhood, you know, children are in a very weak and vulnerable position. And a lot of their survival tactics that they develop is getting attention, right? If I cry, mama will come, she'll give me her breast, I'll feed her and everything will be fine, right? And then if you're dealing with nasty siblings, if I have a tantrum and I weep, you know, maybe somebody will come to my defense. So creating drama becomes a strategy that we all have done and we're continuing to do because it's part of human nature. I do it as well, right? It's just there are some people who learn that is their only way to get ahead in this world. That's their only source of power is creating all of this drama around them. Because as other people get all emotional and upset and react, they actually kind of remain calm and they actually enjoy all of the drama that they're creating, right? So, you know, it's it seems weird that people will deliberately create drama and even invite problems. And I could go into the psychology of it. I was talking to a very interesting psychologist yesterday, but I don't want to bore your listeners with the getting into the weeds of it, why some people actually enjoy pain in life and actually thrive on it. But don't be so stupid and so innocent, naive to believe that there aren't people like that out there in the world because they're all over the place. Yeah, I've encountered uh, some very chaotic people. And, uh, you know, being in prison for six years where people are in the deep end of injecting heroin and stuff like that, and they've suffered horrendous child abuse. I think that was the, the, the greatest education in uh, psychology I could possibly get. But I did get obsessed with the ancient philosophers and psychologists, and I think that's why your books resonated so much, which brings me to Carl Jung. So in your latest, October, coming to terms with our dark side. So is that yeah. like the Jungian harnessing the shadow self? Yes, it's what Jung would call shadow work. So this is goes into a lot of what we've already talked. And I'm actually noticing the millions of trolls that you've stirred up because I can see some of their comments on the side. I have to learn to like ignore them. Um, anyway, <laughs> and I am. Thanks. Um, Thank you for the views, trolls. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so we've been talking about this, but basically what I mean by the dark side of human nature is when you were a child, going back to childhood again, you were kind of this complete person. You felt a whole range of emotions. Sometimes you could be sweet and angelic and nice and everybody loved you. Other times you could be mean and nasty and aggressive and pull your sister's hair and put, you know, nasty things in her drink and et cetera, like my sister did to me once. You know, because we were we didn't have control over this. We we weren't yet socialized. We weren't learned yet hadn't realized that this is bad and there'll be people will hate us for it. You just had these all this complete circle of emotion that you indulged in, right? And then when you're about five or six, people start telling you, No, Robert, you better not do that. You better be nice to your sister. No, Robert, you better not say those kinds of things. No, Robert, you need to behave yourself. People will like you if you're sweet and angelic. Teachers start telling you, friends and colleagues and fellow students start telling you. And slowly, that other side of your nature, I compare it to a round ball, a complete round ball. You start repressing it and pushing it down and down and down until 
instead of the dark side of the moon, the full moon, people are only seeing the, the sunny side, right? They don't see the dark side anymore. You become half of a person in a way because you're pushing down all of those natural, negative, dark, aggressive emotions that stir in each and every single human being, Gandhi and anybody else included, right? Okay. And then what happens? You get into your 20s. You spent your whole life repressing and hiding it from other people. But you can't fool Mother Nature. There's an expression in Latin. You throw nature out, it comes back with a pitchfork. So you try and repress it, it comes back and it hits you right there. And what it happens is you see it all the time with celebrities and such. People start engaging in very weird behavior that seems totally out of their character. They get angry at some, or they're caught literally with their pants down in some illicit affair and they always, they've done something really awful. And then what's the first thing they say? Oh, that wasn't me. Something came over me. That's not who I am. But Jung says in the shadow work, that is exactly who you are. That is exactly what your nature is. You've just been hiding it so successfully for so many years. So the most important thing in shadow work is to recognize that you have your shadow. I have it. You, Sean, have it. Everybody out there listening to it has it. Stop playing the saint. Stop being the social justice warrior and look in the goddamn mirror and recognize your own dark side that you have aggressive impulses, that sometimes you want to hurt people, that you feel envy, that you can be aggressive, etc. And through that self-awareness, you can begin to A, come to terms with it. And since you can't get rid of that dark side, you can't go and get rid of it, find a way, just like with envy, to channel that energy into productive things. So if you're in sports, it's very easy. You take all of your aggressive, dark impulses and you put it into competing and being better than the other side and winning and feeling good about winning. Um, if you're an artist, people who, who, who create movies or write novels, etc., using your dark energy, using some of that negative emotions and putting it into your work is incredibly powerful. It's what makes movies and certain novels, etc., so, you know, it has such resonance to us because they're expressing something that all of us know but are too afraid to talk about, right? Or if you're so upset about injustice in this world, and believe me, there's a lot to be upset about, you can take that energy instead of trolling on the internet, instead of canceling people, you can actually work to do productive things to help the very cause that you believe in. Take that dark energy, stop denying it, and channel it into productive ways. So we've got a global epidemic of drug use. I don't know if you ever partook, Robert, and I don't want you to admit to any felonies. Um, but what I learned from prison was the, the root cause of much crime uh, stemmed back to childhood trauma, sexual abuse, parents dead, thrown away as kids, raised on the streets. These kids then, they're not given the tools psychologically to deal with the trauma. So if they go on to drugs to self-medicate and heroin yeah. being the strongest of those drugs um, takes them completely out of the zone. So right. to finance that, then the men get into stealing or drug dealing, the women right. get into right. sex work, theft. Um, yeah. and, and then they get arrested, put in prison, re-traumatized. They're on the heroin still. How, how could people break that cycle? You do see people get out and some of them go on a mission and they're off the drugs and it's like they've harnessed that dark energy. But the majority, sadly, it's a revolving door. Well, um, it's extremely difficult. If I had the answer to that, you know, I, I, I would write about it. I would help people. But there are people far smarter than me who are grappling with it who don't. Miss, there's no easy answer. But you first have to see, I think therapy is incredibly important. So sometimes that introspecting process which is so important is very difficult to do when you've suffered that kind of trauma i didn't suffer anything like that i suffered a little bit of it so i can understand what that's like but it's very very difficult on your own to analyze it so therapy i mean if you're in the prison system i don't think you can really rely on therapists but if you're not in the prison system Therapy would be the most important thing because you get an objective mirror. This person, you can talk about your childhood. You can go into things in a way that you that you you feel 
secure in, the person isn't going to betray you. Whereas if you told a friend about it, you might feel, hmm, I don't feel comfortable here. And this, they can give you some really excellent feedback about the wound that you have suffered, right? Because we all have wounds from our childhood. Some are much stronger and worse than others, like you say. But none of us got exactly the kind of love and attention that we want. And because of that wound and because of that lack, either it's abuse or abandonment. Abandonment is a form of abuse where parents don't give you the kind of attention that you need, right? Right. So all of us have that to some degree, and some people a lot worse, but you have to recognize it first. You have to look back at your past and come to terms with it. Because if you don't make that first step, you're trapped in these compulsive patterns. You're gonna be create, recreating it continually. Maybe in prison, you maybe are forced to stop taking drugs, obviously, but you're not dealing with the underlying roots of it. And the moment you get out, you're back in that whirlwind again, you have no control. So self-awareness is the key to any kind of change, right? So if you go deep into analyzing the roots of the problem, why you need to soothe and self-medicate yourself because of that initial wound from your parents, whatever that form of abuse was, you can't get out of it. So you have to look at it, you have to be able to analyze it, and then you say, all right, I recognize the source of it, this parent or whatever. Now, let me look at the patterns in my life that reveal the wound itself. And then you have to be, it's very difficult and very painful, but you see that you've taken these patterns and you've used it in your relationships, that you're actually attracted to people who will hurt you, which is a very common phenomenon of people who've suffered abuse. I get attacked for that when I tell people saying that, like, Oh, Robert, you're blaming the victim. I'm not blaming the victim. I'm just trying to be honest with you. And sometimes when you've suffered abuse from somebody else, it's almost like you want to feel that pain again. I know that's very counterintuitive, but it makes you feel like you can maybe rewrite the script from your childhood or whatever. There are other many underlying causes. But you have to first look at, do the introspective work, recognize the patterns in your life, and then go, damn it, I'm not going to give into that. And then it's a process of taking baby steps to sort of be able to break some of these compulsive patterns in your life. I, I mean, I, I don't want to be glib because I know how complicated it is, but that's some of what I would advise. Brilliant. Sadly, Robert, there's more drugs in prison than anywhere on the face of the earth. And I'm one sorry, of the I didn't know that. I didn't know yeah, that. One, one of the primary methods is, is the staff. So you've, you've got... Um, the, the legal market in drugs gets bigger every year and it, it, it's always going to corrupt members of every profession and to keep to ensure it keeps flowing that's sadly the way it works and the majority are injecting heroin well you know i did do drugs when i was younger i'm not going to get uh, arrested for that because you know these are things so many years ago and i didn't break any laws but, you know, I was obviously in college and I'm old enough where it was the 70s and everybody was smoking pot. I was smoking pot. I was smoking hash. I took LSD. I took peyote. I took mushrooms. I did cocaine. I did the whole gamut, right? I understand very well the attraction of drugs. And for me, it had a slightly positive use. I hate to say it because I don't advocate it in that. It made me realize, particularly the hallucinogenic drugs, that there is something greater out there in the world than my banal, miserable life. The universe is in it's insane. It, may it opened my mind to certain great things, and I've never forgotten them, right? So, But most people use drugs in a different form. They use it to kind of soothe themselves, to medicate themselves, to dull the pain in their life. And that is not a positive thing. And I know that because I had that as well in certain phases of my life. And I, I would never go back to that because I know that it's going to send me down a rabbit hole. Yeah, there's a lot of self-medication going on. So in May, you talk about recognizing toxic types and disguised power structures. We've talked about toxic types. I've not got to May yet in the book. What are disguised power structures? Is that the actual word that I use? 
Um, let me have a look in. I mean, I'm wondering if the English edition changed my language. May let's have a look. Um, yeah, yeah. So May is the supposed non-players of power, recognizing toxic types and disguised power structures. Really, I didn't even know I used that language. Yeah, that's where I'm gonna have to go back and look at that. Um, well, so what your question is is which part of it now? I'm sorry. What again. are toxic uh, um, disguised power structures? What does that mean? Well, not remembering that I actually wrote that, I have to kind of quickly come up with some clever answer. But, um, well, you know, um, power structures are inherently... So nobody writes down on a piece of paper, these are the power structures in our office. These are the power structures in our house with the family and, and, and the siblings, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's tacit. It's, Ill, it's implicit. You know, I know that there's a boss out there. I better not mess with him or her. But then there are things that are subtler than that. Sometimes the boss isn't the person really with power. They're just basically a figurehead. And that there's a man or a woman behind the throne who's actually controlling the puppet strings. And I advocate when you enter some kind of social realm, whether it's not at a party, obviously, but like in your office, etc., to be a very attentive observer of all of the silent things that are going on, of what the culture is about, who kind of determines the culture. Sometimes there are people you didn't recognize, like somebody in, in HR, what we call human resources here, I don't know if it's the same in England, who is actually setting the boundaries and you go past them and you're gonna be canceled, et cetera. Who is it that's really controlling the puppet strings? What are the little trigger wires that if I go past, I'm going to pay a price. I'm going to pay a penalty for it, right? So just be aware that the power structures, and that just doesn't apply to your office. It applies to politics. It applies to the United States. It applies to Great Britain. You know, it's not the president of the United States who controls all of the game here. It's corporations. It's lobbyists. But that's not written down in the Constitution. In the American Constitution, it's not said that lobbyists shall control this because it's impl it's implicit, it's tacit. So wise up and understand that what you think is the power structure is often not at all. That there's something going on that's behind the scenes that's hidden from your view. You have to learn to analyze it and see who really, really has power, who really benefits from this or that. I think that's what I meant. Okay. So I was fascinated by read, I was fascinated by reading your life history and how you uh -oh. were do dozens of jobs. I think it was up to 90 jobs and that taught Not you the quite, but... in, in, interpersonal dynamics and the, you know, the passive aggressives and all the different mind yeah. games. Yeah. What actually inspired you to become a writer? Well, I've been writing since I was eight years old. I, I think I probably when I was maybe about 10 or 11 decided I wanted to be a writer because I love books so much. And I had, a, I thought I had a little bit of talent for writing. And, and in high school, I got more pronounced. And then I graduated college and I go, I want to be a writer, but I have to make a living. So I went into journalism. And I didn't really like journalism. And then I, just, I wandered around Europe for three or four years working in Dublin, working in London, working in Paris, working in Greece, working in Spain, all kinds of different jobs, not quite 90, but dozens of different jobs, construction in Greece, but only, and I have piano hands too. So that was kind of a rough <laughs> world for me anyway. Um, and I could never figure out what it was I was to write. You know, I couldn't figure out whether I was writing novels or screenplays or newspaper articles, et cetera. So I've always wanted to be a writer, but in those 60 different jobs, I think it was more like in the 60s, I observed so many ugly power games, so many manipulative people, particularly in Hollywood. And then I had one job that was kind of the weirdest job of all. I was a skip tracer in a detective agency here in Pasadena, California. And you're wondering, what the hell is a skip tracer? A skip tracer, what it means is, these are people who have skipped paying bills, who have skipped the law, who are running away from something that they've done and nobody can figure out where they are. 
right? And insurance agencies, et cetera, hire you to find them. But I'm working in an office and the people instructed me how to do this. They give you kind of scripts to read. It's all about lying and decepting, deception. So you learn if the guy's in Wisconsin, you're here in Pasadena, you get the number of his mother, you call his mother and you're basically reading from a script, but you kind of improvise and you go, oh, you know, I'm an old college friend of Brian, right? And, you know, we did so many great things together, blah, 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 blah. I really need to contact him again. Do you have any idea where, she, where he is? And the mother doesn't want to reveal and you go, you know, you kind of learn to get little bits of information, you piece it together and then you find him. It was a cruel job and it made me feel awful. And I quit after three or four, it was paid well, but I quit because I felt terrible about myself because I was basically going after poor people who were doing things that they couldn't help. You know, it's the classic stealing a loaf of bread so that your family can eat kind of thing. So I quit the job, but it showed me how easy people can be lied to and you can get away with it, how easy it is to manipulate and it's a very dangerous power. So all of, and particularly my Hollywood experiences taught me that people want power in life. They want a degree of control over their circumstances, but they don't want to admit this to themselves. They want to say that they're doing it for the greater cause, for mankind, for creating a great film, but they're actually obsessed with power, but nobody writes about that. So I thought I would be the one to write about. So that was sort of the genesis of my first books. Wow. This is Andrew, my co-host, and I believe he has a question for you. I don't have a question for him. <laughs> don't put me on the spot on the, like that. I'm putting you on the spot here, Andrew. Come on, get up to speed. Rob. Think, think of a question. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, I, Andrew, I, I, Andrew, Andrew do you want power, but you won't admit it? Uh, you know what? That's a very interesting uh, question because I've always been someone who's really struggled with, I'm thinking on the spot here, <laughs> I'm someone who's always really struggled with hierarchies and I think I'm not somebody who likes um, authority. I think I have a problem with it. I always have done and teachers and things like that. I found that very difficult, but also I've never been comfortable leading in any way. Uh, my documentaries, I make documentaries. Uh, nice to meet you, Robert, by the way. I'm Andrew. Very nice to um, meet you, Andrew. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Sorry. I've heard you're wonderful. I, I'm not familiar with your work, unfortunately, but Sean, I don't want to embarrass him, but my <laughs> word, has he been going on about it for months? He's saying, you got to read Robert Green. Robert Green, he's oh, coming oh, on the show. Oh, nice. Thank you. <laughs> so oh, thank he you. was so excited. So, so I, I gather it's fantastic. And, and obviously, you're, I knew your, I knew your, your name. Um, but uh, yes, so so what does that mean, Sean and, and Robert? I, I don't. My, yes, I, I have a problem telling people when I'm making the documentaries if I'm in charge because I'm the, on on screen and I, I sort of have to say to people like, "Oh, do you mind doing that thing?" and it, and they end up sort of being in control of me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Can I play one little minor power game here? I mm -hmm. really have to go to the bathroom again. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. It's like I've been holding it in for 15 <gasps> minutes, but I can't do it anymore. So give, uh, me yes. like, give me like 45 seconds, please. Oh, that'll be fantastic. Go. Thank you, Robert. I'll be right back. Sorry. Go. Cheers. Let's okay. put him off the screen. Yeah. So Robert is obviously being so gracious with his time here. Mm -hmm. um, we've gone past the hour and he's just said that he's going to come back and spend some more time with us. So if people want to put questions, wherever you're watching this, YouTube, Facebook, blah, 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 um, put questions below the video. They're all going to come up on our restream software. And we will put some of your viewer questions to him. And this mm -hmm. also gives Andrew time to get up to speed and think up some questions <laughs> yeah if only i'd been listening when i should have been but you know what i'm so shattered again i, I know i keep say, saying this but the, the what you do is amazing because it's just after the first few hours my brain is just going like that so i need like that hour and i went and made a bagel and then my, my nut nutella was frozen because the kitchen <laughs> i just had the heating in here girlfriend's gone away the whole rest of the flat i've just left cold nutella was frozen had to put it in a pot with boiling water <laughs> the glass and then i wondered if the glass might shatter with the nutella in it and it was okay put it on the bagel banana <laughs> on the nutella everything's all right but how was that mate i know he's coming back in a second but your hero 
I'm totally jacked up on chocolate oranges, booji boojas, and Robert Green right now. I'm like, you would not think this is on. We're almost eight. We're what are we at? Seven hours, ten minutes in. <laughs> Having the time of my life. Thanks, Ash. <laughs> Oh, what have you learned from Robert? Oh my goodness. You know what? I'm going to listen to it again because as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking of questions. I'm looking at live chat, but I'm realizing there is so much wisdom in what he has said this evening, especially with the podcast war stuff. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to listen to this interview again to just, just (laughs) glean those nuggets of wisdom that have come out of Robert tonight. We've asked, uh, thank you so much for spending this much time with us, Robert. Sorry. Yeah. We've, we've asked the viewers if they've got any questions for you, but, but, but also Andrew had a question and I wanted to answer that. Can I do that first? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can come on my own podcast to answer it if you want, Robert, another time. Oh, okay. I didn't. Sure. Sure. I'd love to. Um, Yeah. Right. Basically I'm similar to you. I don't like authority and that's why I had 65 different jobs because I hated working for other people. I hated their power games. I hated the manipulations going on. I wanted my own, I wanted to be able to run my own business and work on my work for myself, you know, and not have to deal with all this crap. And that's why I ended up finally, I can, I can do that with the life that I have now. So I had a a strong rebellious streak. And also I find it a little hard to play, to play the hardball game with people. So if I'm in position of power, which I'm sort of now, I have a few employees, mm-hmm. I find it very difficult to criticize them, although I've learned to do that. It's not comfortable for me to be a leader, right? Yeah. I just kind of yeah. want to be on my own. I just want to do my own thing. I don't want to deal with your ego issues, your envy, your slackering, all these other things. But you know, you have to deal with that in this life or you're not going to be able to go very far. So mm-hmm. my wife is a filmmaker, right? She's a director of films. And if you think directing a film is difficult, well, try being a woman and directing a film. It's like 80 times harder, you know? And she finds it difficult to tell, to yell at people, to tell them what to do, because then there she's labeled as some nasty bitch, right? Mm-hmm. The same kind of things that a man can do, she can't do. And I've had to give her advice over the years that you can't let people walk over you. The main thing that you want is you want to create a great film. You want to create a great documentary. I want to create a great book. Sean wants to create a great podcast. If people are getting in your way with their stupid, silly ego games, you have to get a little bit of a a, a steel in your spine and go, it's not comfortable for me, but I've got to be a little bit nasty with them. I've either got to fire them I've got to make them realize what they're doing because they are ruining my product. They are sabotaging Mm -hmm. it and I'm not going to put up with it. I understand the discomfort with that because I don't feel comfortable with it, but you have to do that. Otherwise what you make, what you love is going to suffer in the process. Oh, it's so hard though. And I would have that feeling afterwards of like, oh, what, you know, what a shame. It was a beautiful documentary, but I fell out with, and you know what I find, and I I think you're probably, this is probably what you would argue actually, is that because I go about it in such a roundabout way, I end up actually falling out with people. Um, I try so hard not to, and I should have said things earlier and I let it get to a point when they've risen high enough. And then, so there was a guy who was an assistant director uh, well, it was assistant producer on on a documentary I was making in Argentina, and he just kept uh, ha- he kept saying, "Why don't we should do this? We should do that." And I knew I was much more experienced than him, and I'd done this a lot more. And I, I thought, "I'm yeah. better than you. I know what I'm doing, and I'm in charge of this." And I kept saying, "Oh, maybe, oh, maybe." And eventually, it got to a point where he felt strong enough that he was very challenging. And if I, I if I'd nipped it in the bud early on, I don't think that would have happened. So I think I think you're spot on. Yeah, it's what we talked about with with Sean about the deterrent strategy. So if people are more aggressive than you if they're more amoral they're willing to do things that you're not willing to do and you signal to them that they can get away with it that just makes them even bolder that makes that brings the lion out of the out of them they go wow i get away with more in dealing with Mm -hmm. andrew so here i go you know so you have to draw boundaries and limits and say i'm willing to put up with some people's crap i'm trying to be nice but if they pass this limit which is they're messing with the actual finished product, I'm going to make them pay a price. 
as you got more successful, Robert, did yeah. you attract people trying to take advantage of your good nature? And did any of those people successfully employ a strategy on you that blindsided you? Well, you know, it's so irritating because I wrote the 48 Laws of Power. And obviously, I know what I wrote. You know, I'm not stupid. I know what they are. I'm very aware of it. And yet people continually try and think that they can get away with doing all kinds of weird things to me. And I'm going, I wrote the book. I'm not trying to say that I'm like Jesus Christ here or anything. I have limitations. There are things I'm not good at. But I wrote the damn book. I know what you're doing. I know the game that you're playing. Don't think that I'm not aware of it just because I act like a nice guy. Yeah, it happens still to this day. I'm dealing with it all the time now that I've had, you know, my, my little tiny company here is growing. I'm dealing with it, an issue right now that I don't want to go into because of all sorts of other reasons of people. And you know what a lot of it is, and I think Andrew can, can identify with it. A lot of it is people's egos. They think that they're not being recognized for their brilliance for, for, for all how much they can contribute to this, that they don't feel comfortable with you being the boss. They want to have more power and control. They want attention for their own skill, their own creativity. Sometimes it's justified because they are genuinely creative people and you want them in your life and you want to help them and you want to give them credit. But a lot of times they're people who are foolish, who have bad ideas, who don't know what they're doing, who don't have a sense of the overall vision that you're trying to create and they get in your way. And I'm dealing with this right now as I speak. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritties of it, but mm. yeah. Well, Sean. If you if mm. somebody pulled a strategy on you that you hadn't covered and it, it blindsided you, would you have a grudging respect for that? Yeah, of course. Why? Do you have an idea what that would be? Are you going to try pl <laughs> playing it on me? <laughs> I can I'll I mean, do that. <laughs> I mean, I've, 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 I, I must admit, I have limitations, and I can be played as well. And I make a point in the Forty Eight Laws of Power. I have a story about Al Capone, one of the meanest son of the bitches that ever lived, and how a con artist named Victor Lustig, one of the great con artists in American history, completely conned Al Capone out of hundreds of thousands of dollars, the equivalent of millions today knowing full well that he would be at the bottom of a river cased in concrete if he ever got caught. And yet he did it and Al Capone fell for it. So the cleverest people are often the most vulnerable. And I've been played before as well. You know, I was hired to be on the board of directors of a publicly traded company called American Apparel, right? Because I knew the CEO, we became friends. And he kind of played me. He seduced me. He created this friendship. Whereas on the board of directors, you're supposed to have some distance. You're not supposed to be favoring management or the CEO or the shareholder. You're supposed to really be protecting the shareholders, right? And he played a game on me by kind of putting, casting a spell and making it so that I felt like I really needed to help him and defend him. And it kind of got, mm -hmm. didn't get me in trouble, but it led to things that weren't very good and I had to learn from that lesson. So I have certainly been played before. I am no paragon of power. It's just that mm. I, I realized it fairly quickly. It reminds me of, um, there's, there's a book called The Intelligence Trap, and I think Sean also interviewed David Robson, who, who wrote that. Uh, and he, he gives us an example, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, the, Sh the, the ah. Sherlock writer, and he, he believed in fairies. This idea that the, yes, some of the did. smartest people can still be led astray is really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I would, I'd um, like to ask you, so I haven't, obviously, I'm, I'm coming at this from a place of total ignorance, having not yet read your books, um, but I, will, I would like to, if I can get you on my podcast especially, but even if not, I would like to. Yeah. Um, the, the one of your laws about, about like power um, and don't talk too much. And I, I find, <clears throat> are there exceptions when you try and talk too much, like I'm doing now? Um, <laughs> sometimes I, I'm, I'm aware in a sort of an old Woody Allen kind of way. Uh, I feel like I use... I, I, how do I explain it? I try to act stupid on purpose because I know that that can give me a secret power when I'm present, when I'm on screen interviewing with like an abusive exorcist. I'll pretend that I uh, agree with him. Like, oh, you, you, you just saw a vampire, did you? Mm. Brilliant. And then, 
that's is that something of interest to you that kind of power of course it is of course it is i have a i have one of the laws of power called um i forget what it's called but it's basically play dumber than your mark seem to be more stupid than the other person right so people think that their weak spot is their looks or their morality, et cetera, but their weak spot really is their intelligence. Even the man who's, or woman who's doing the plumbing in your house thinks that he is the best plumber on the planet and he has more intelligence than you when it comes to you know, the pipes underneath your house. Everybody thinks that they're intelligent, at least in some way. If you make them feel like they are actually more intelligent than you, that you're stupider than you, they are, than they, than they are, that they need you need their information, or that you agree with them, all of the natural, normal human resistance and defensiveness that people have suddenly mm. starts going down, and it melts, and they open up to you. You know, interviewing is a skill. Believe me, I know because I've been interviewed many times, and some people are great interviews. And some people are terrible interviews. Mm, sure. Sean is one of Sean is one yeah, of the, the latter of, yeah. of, of the former. <laughs> <laughs> Sean's in the latter. <laughs> I see we have some envy issues here. Um, yes. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, so you know, one of the great interviewers uh, of modern times was this woman, uh, Oriana Falacci, an Italian journalist who back in the 60s and 70s interviewed Kissinger and Nixon and the Chinese premier and the Shah of Iran. And for each person, she played kind of dumb and stupid, like the stupid ditzy woman that didn't understand it. And Mm. she got them to open up and say the stupidest things that ended up being incredibly self-incriminating. And even after people knew about her reputation, they would still fall for that. One of the classic examples was Henry Kissinger. Talk about, you know, somebody falling like an Al Capone or a, or a Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, Henry Kissinger, my God, he fell mm. for Oriana Falacci's game. So getting people the sense that they have a little uh, edge on you when it comes to intelligence is an absolutely brilliant strategy, particularly for an interviewer. Mm. Zaref, the alchemist, one of the viewers, has asked, what book are you working on next, Robert? Um, I'm working on a kind of a different book. It's, I hate to use the word spiritual, but I guess I have to. It's a book about what I call the sublime. And I've talked about it in the, for, in the book I wrote with 50 Cent, the last chapter about confronting your mortality and the fact that you're going to die, get over that fear. And then it was the last chapter of the laws of human nature, which is literally called confront your mortality. And What that means is death is the greatest fear that we have. It's the greatest negative thing that we fear the most, obviously, right? And we try and run away from it. But actually, when you, I say, when you turn around and you face it, it's actually the most beautiful thing that can happen to you, which is what happened to me when I had to face death, literally when I was in a coma and I, and I felt literally the life being drained out of me, like I could be in the process of dying. So by confronting your mortality, you see the preciousness of your life, that the world that you live in is actually absolutely incredible that you took so many things for granted. And it's not like you have to climb Mount Everest or go up into outer space with Jeff Bezos to have these kind of sublime experiences. They're around you just looking out your window. I'm looking out my window right now and I'm having that sensation. And so I'm writing a book on this And it's not just about death, although that'll be the last chapter again. It's about how being a human being and being a social animal, we continually create boundaries and limits. I compare it to like a circle. And this is, these are the actions and thoughts that you are allowed to have in our culture. You're not supposed to think these things because that goes against our code here. It's a code. And what that code was for ancient Egypt is not the same as it is for now, but that circle is the same. They had a circle and we have a circle. And I maintain that going beyond that circle, thinking thoughts that we're not supposed to think, engaging in in behavior that is not actually what what we prescribe is the realm of the sublime. And it opens your minds up to new ways of looking at the world. It expands your consciousness to use a cliche. 
So each chapter I have is about, the first chapter is about the cosmic sublime, about the insanity of this universe that we live in. The second one is about evolution and how absolutely insane the thought it is to think that I'm st sitting here with Sean Atwood and Andrew Gold in here in 2021 having this discussion when 100,000 years ago, we were all basically, you know, these, these, you know, we were still homo sapiens. But to think that we came this far and how we did it and how unlikely it is utterly sublime. I have a chapter I'm writing now about childhood and the sublime aspects of childhood. So I'm covering all of the aspects, but death as the sort of ultimate limit and boundary in exploring to me is the ultimate sublime. Mm. So that's my long winded answer for your question. Yeah, wow. we're all gonna we're all gonna be dust in hundreds of years from now. So enjoy the miracle yeah. of your existence. Yeah. Fata Fata has asked, has Robert any advice for dealing with grief? Whew. Um Yeah, I mean I know um so for instance, one of the worst experiences for me grief wise was I think twenty one years ago when my father passed away. You know, that was my first real experience with the death of a loved one. I know people, most people have gone through much worse than I've had friends die. But your father, at least for a man, if you had a good relationship, is a very powerful experience. You know, it was very, very emotional for me. And the natural thing after you feel grief, strangely enough, is to feel anger. And I felt a lot of anger. And I've since studied it, and it's an incredibly common phenomenon where you get angry almost at people kind of ignoring the reality of their life, that death is this reality, that people are going on in this kind of oblivion, and they're not aware that tomorrow it could all be shattered. It's a little more complex than that. But the thing about grief is it's a good thing. You want to give into it. You don't want to deny it. You don't want to medicate yourself. You don't want to start drinking. You don't want to start doing all kinds of behavior that's going to disguise the actual wound that you've suffered. You want to go further into it. You actually want to dive into it. You want to feel the feeling. You want to hold on to it, not obsessively, but you want to let it become a part of you, right? And, and, and deal with it and go through that process. And I took me many months to get to deal with the death of my father. And to this day, I'm can, even last night, I have dreams about him. He's constantly in my dreams 21 years later. And the pain is still sort of there. I remember waking up this morning going with a tinge of sadness. I'm continually dreaming about him. But you have to, you have to dig into it. You can't run away from it. That would be my best advice for dealing with any kind of grief. Because once you go through that, other things will happen. And the wound, instead of trying to avoid it, will, will slowly heal if you allow yourself to give into that emotion. Wow. Andrew? Yeah, I, well, I'm just fascinated. Firstly, that was a very beautiful um, explanation. It's, 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 I, I still have my grandfather in my dream. It's, sometimes it becomes quite a creepy dream, actually. It's, it can go quite horrible. But I, but I know what you mean, and you wake up and it's not a nice feeling. Um, your book, uh, the Sublime, it sounds sounds fantastic, and um, I, I I wonder if there's anything that can make me view death differently because, it, as you say, it's the scariest thing I can think of. Whenever I've tried to, you know, I've had people on my podcast before who've spoken about it in a very beautiful way. Whether it be a scientist who says I want my own students to dissect me and I'll be a skeleton hanging up in the classroom uh, to teach for the rest of time. <laughs> That was uh, Professor Dame Sue Black. She was just, she's the most wow. fascinating woman. I think I know person. her. I think I know her, I oh, think I know her books. Yes. Yeah. I, forensic. She's a forensic psychiatrist, I think, or uh -huh. criminol criminologist or something like that. Most of, She blew my mind with all of that. And people wrote in going, wow, that helped so much. And I'm in theory that helped me. And then I'm sort of, oh, no, it didn't change anything really deep down. I read Hitchens' last book, As He Was Dying, uh, all these kinds of things. And is it is it that certain people just cannot 
get to grips with it and some can or or is it something i read recently about when you're like 50 or 60 years old people start to become more uh philosophical and you're able to sort of and, and i guess that you have to don't you by that age what do you think well there's a difference in that um what's happening is is you're intellectualizing the concept of death which creates some distance from you it's an idea it's not a reality mm -hmm. and i try telling people you know what it means to be alive. You feel the blood flowing through. You feel your heart beating. But you mm. also have death inside of you as well, just as much as you have life. But you're not feeling it. It becomes an intellectual idea, a concept, and therefore it's dead for you. So how do you, how do you actually feel death inside of you? When you're about to fall asleep, you have a moment where your consciousness kind of fades and you slip into sleep. That is a slight intimation of death itself, right? When you separate from people, when other people die in your life, or you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you split up and they're gone, that is a slight intimation of death, but not in an intellectual way, in a visceral human way where it's actually inside your body. So the concept of death has to become what they call embodied consciousness. It has to be a physical thing. It has to be inside of you, not just this intellectual idea of, yeah, in 30 years, maybe I'll deal with it. Yeah, maybe I'll die. So, no, you could die tomorrow. And it's inside mm. of you. And that feeling that I had of life being drained from within can happen to you any day now. And so I had this demonstrated to me. I wrote the 18th chapter of the Laws of Human Nature in May of 2018. And the, I finished my book. I was so relieved. And I turned to the publisher, and it's now the summer. And I'm starting to relax. And three months after I wrote that chapter, I came this close to dying. I had a stroke because I had so exhausted myself. So what I wrote about was a slightly intellectual idea, but now it wasn't intellectual anymore. It was very real, right? And so the difference is I call it a visceral connection to death as opposed to an intellectual one where you actually feel it inside of you and you come to terms with it, and then you can release the fear. So I meditate every morning. And one thing I haven't done as much recently since my stroke, but what I used to do was I would literally meditate on my own death. I would imagine a day in 2040, let's just say, throw out, and I'm on my death, but it's my last day on the life. I'm in bed, I'm looking out the window, I'm saying goodbye to people. I'm feeling it inside of me in a very powerful, visceral way. I'm not just thinking about it. I'm, re I'm living it. I know it sounds horrible. It sounds gloomy. It sounds morbid. But actually, it's a very beautiful thing to go through because it's a reality. It's, not, it's the only reality we have. We can argue about everything, but nobody can argue about death. You know, Jim Morrison said, nobody here gets out alive. That's literally true, right? So confronting it in a physical way is the way out of this kind of trap that we're in where we just imagine death and it just becomes an idea in our heads. Mm. That's very beautiful, very beautifully put. I'm glad to see you looking so well after the stroke as well. I'm so sorry <laughs> yeah. to hear you went through that. Yeah, a lot of plastic Quest surgery, you know. <laughs> Question from Linda. Since your life-changing experience, have you noticed oh. you're being challenged more? What does that mean, being challenged more? I'm not quite sure. Can you help me with that? Maybe you smart guys there. My interpretation of that is that the people that you perhaps surround yourself with or do business with, some of them are being more aggressive towards you, perhaps. No, I've had one good thing. You know, I have a slightly negative slant towards people in human nature i can't deny it it's it's a problem i've dealt with since childhood mm -hmm. um but i've been pleasantly surprised how nice people have been to me and i don't necessarily deserve all this niceness so i'll be walking down the street and people will be they see that i walk with a cane that i have a very kind of strange way of walking very slowly they're so nice to me they try to help i go into stores Oh. Everybody, when you literally have a disability like I do and getting out of my car, people are really nice. And it's actually kind of affirmed something about 
human nature. It sort of pleasantly surprised me. So most people don't take this as like, wow, Robert Greene is weak. Let's attack him. They actually say <laughs> no. Robert Greene is human. He, 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 he's, you know, he, he almost died and he's not making, you know, he's try, trying to make a big deal of it. But, you know, obviously it's been a terrible experience. It creates a, a, a connection and empathy. So I've had the opposite experience. It's been actually really nice to see how people mm-hmm. kind of change their opinion of you when they see that you're actually weak and vulnerable. Yeah. Can you see that one, Andrew? Yep. Yeah. Do you want me to read it out? Yeah, go for it. Okay. From Zareth the Alchemist. Since Robert's wife is a filmmaker, has he considered collaborating with her and making a documentary on his works? Ask him that from me, Sean Atwood. Um, I did it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, um, I don't really want to have a documentary about me already. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still alive and maybe, maybe when I'm gone or something, I don't know. I don't think I did. I don't think it would be that interesting. Cause in fact, I lead an incredibly boring life, probably the most boring life on the planet. All I do is sit in my office and write and read books mm-hmm. about dead people and write about them. I don't know what a documentary <laughs> would do. It'd be like Andy Warhol's, <laughs> A 22 hour documentary called sleep where he literally filmed somebody sleeping you know okay so it, i don't think we're going to do a documentary mm-hmm. but i i work with my wife she edits every chapter that i write she's been doing it since the 48 most well, since since mastery basically i give her every chapter that i write she reads it first i help her with all of her screenplays because i used to write screenplays and I'm kind of a failed novelist and play, failed playwright myself. So we have a very collaborative process. And I think someday we will maybe work on something together because we have our ideas kind of aligned, right? And she has a project now that she's working on that I'm helping her a lot with. It's just you have to be careful because when you're in a relationship and you're on a film set or something, things can get a little difficult and it can strain your relationship. I know because I worked in Hollywood for a husband and wife team. She was a screenwriter. He was a screenwriter and a director. And they would have the nastiest fights Hmm. where I think their relationship is over. But then the next day they would make up. Everything was fine. So I think it'll happen someday. But I'm a little bit, it could be a little bit dangerous. I've got a bit of a cheeky question coming for you, Robert. hope you don't mind. Um, They've asked, did you use the art of seduction to get your wife <laughs> into into bed. I see the last. One. She's not... He saw it, Sean. You tried to hide it. <laughs> it comes I deleted up on my that screen. so fast as well. It comes up on my screen. Um, but fortunately, fortunately, she's not here right now. She's out. But yes, she knows the story. Yes, I did use the art of seduction, even though I met her before I wrote the art of seduction. So. Um, we had started go I li- we lived in the same neighborhood and I would see her all the time and I was kind of very interested in her and I got myself invited to a party at her house through some clever tactics and then I invited her out for an evening and you know it was very nice I called her and I didn't hear back from her and I'm going hmm maybe this isn't going to work out maybe you know something is wrong here and then I met her on the street and I was a little bit, to be honest with you, a little bit peeved that she hadn't called me back. And she was actually being nice and friendly, although she might have a different version of the story. Um, and I said, yes, it's actually my birthday today. I'm, do you want to come to my birthday? Um, you can come for dessert, come later on, because I've invited these people over for, for the dinner. But please feel come over. And she, she said, OK. But I knew in the back of my mind that at that time, I had eight friends who were going to be there who happened to be eight really beautiful women who were my friends and some of my former girlfriends. And that she would see me surrounded by this bevy of beautiful women, right? And she would assume that I had all of this power and charm and seductive qualities, which I perhaps probably didn't have but just by virtue of association. And that's one of the arts of seduction is creating triangles of desire, right? Where it's the, it's the equivalent of you pass a restaurant and there's one person in there and it looks kind of gloomy and you go, I'm not eating there. 
and you pass another restaurant and there are 25 people inside and they're all laughing and drinking wine, having a good time. You go, yeah, that looks like a place I'm going to go eat in, right? So if you're surrounded, I don't mean to take this metaphor too far, but if you're surrounded by all these desirable people, you must be somebody who's desirable yourself. So I'm not saying it got her into bed to use his language, but it definitely, you know, it definitely worked. And she recognizes that she laughs at the story. She knows that I played one of the subsequent laws in the art of seduction on her. And she doesn't, she doesn't resent it. She finds it kind of funny. We're going to, we're going to finish here soon, Robert. You've been extremely generous with your time, but I'm oh. curious of one thing. What was the tactic that you used to get invited to the party? <laughs> well, um, so I can't remember, she would be better at this than I would, but I heard about her party somehow. I don't know how, because we lived, as I said, kind of neighbors and we would go to the same cafe. This was in Santa Monica at the time. So I somehow heard of the party and we had a common friend, a woman named Kiki and Kiki was somebody that I was starting to date, but it wasn't really going well. And I knew Kiki was friends with, with now my, my wife. And I said, can you get me invited to this party? I don't want to be the one that invites myself. I don't want to go up to her and invite myself because that makes me look desperate. It makes me look like maybe I'm a stalker. But if this other woman who's a good friend of hers gets me into the party, then I cover my tracks. I don't look like I'm actually trying to manipulate my way into her apartment. So that was the strategy that I used. Wow. This has been <laughs> absolutely fantastic. Honestly, we've covered so much ground. Oh. Uh, the finale, we've, we've, this has been an eight hour live stream for me and Andrew today. Are you really, really eight hours? Eight hours. This is the eighth hour. We're 20 minutes away. And, uh, are, you on could... a, are you on uh, Are you on amphetamines or something? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> chocolate <laughs> orange. I've been eating chocolate. I'm jacked up on chocolate orange. Oh. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. do, do you ever come to London, Robert? Uh, I, I, you know, I used to live in London um, back in the early 80s before you were probably born. Um, and uh, I, I had it. <sighs> English wife, if you can believe it as well. Um, so I have ties to England and a lot of friends there. And I've been invited to come for my birthday in May of next year by my publisher. And we're planning it and everything. So I will be there in May unless the pandemic reaches this point where everything's closed. So you never know. So I will be there hopefully in May because I, I love London. I can't, I can't wait to return there. Well, if you could spare any more time, we would love to take you out for a meal and uh, oh, socialize. That would be that very would be nice. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. What part of London do you live in? So I am southwest of London in a town called Guildford. It's got a historical castle. Uh, have you ever seen that horror movie, The Omen? Sure. Yeah, some of that was filmed at Guildford Cathedral. There's a, oh. a river. There's a river. And oh, it's, well, yeah, it's, it... well, my my wife is working on a, a novel and a screenplay that takes place in England and the, the um, protagonists live in a castle and it's mm. kind of a gothic thing. Should she look into this? Yeah, perhaps. Uh, there, there's some right. fantastic locations around here, real old churches and stuff. There's an old church out on a country walk I go on, which the public don't really access. And that church has been utilized multiple times for movies. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, definitely get in touch when I'm in town. It'll be like the middle of May of next year. Yeah, that would be, uh, I would be blown away if we could uh, go out for a meal. That would be fantastic, yeah. Okay. Well, um, can so, I just say, Robert, when you suggested that Sean might not have been born in the 80s or early 80s, was that a power play? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, this, I he goes back some. He goes back. That, that, I, would, make I, him, yeah. that would make him like in his early 40s. So I'm well, essentially least, what, saying... What are you, Sean? I was born, the year was it... Which assassination was it? Martin Luther King, was it? 1968? Oh, wow, okay. You, you, what's your secret? You're like Dorian Gray or something. <laughs> yes. do, you have a, do you have a painting in the closet? <laughs> Yoga, yeah. standing on my head a lot. No, my mom oh. looks very young, so okay. I'm, I'm blessed, blessed that she passed that down. Okay, so, so you, you were like... You were like 15 years old when I lived in London. We might have crossed paths. Who knows? 
Yeah, I was up by Liverpool um, back oh, when okay. I was a young person. Oh, and you have was... you have a bit of a, 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 a northern English accent, don't you? Definitely. But when I arrived in the States, they couldn't understand the word I said. So I had to yeah. change my accent. So I'm, I'm become much clearer when I was working in the stock market on the phones. Oh, you worked in New York in the stock market? No, in Arizona as a stockbroker. Wow. Yeah. Well, you young... have great stories to tell. You, you, you should write a book about your, your life. Well, it's a trilogy, and I'd, I'd be happy to mail you that one as well. <laughs> You've already written it? It's public? Yeah, I've written 15 books at this point, and my life story Whoa. is a trilogy. Robert, wow. Sean's life is, it, is extraordinary, and I had, him, I had him as a guest on my podcast. That's how we met, and I interview often. I mean, I know I've invited you on, but often I get psychopaths and murderers. So that's why Sean fitted in. Well, I'd be uh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would. But uh, short, I, know, I will get in touch with you actually to see if I can get you on. If you don't mind, that'd be that'd be great. No, no, no. I, I I'd be I'd be honoured. But somebody should do a documentary about him, not about me. I Your know. life is oh, much they, more they probably have. They there's, have there's about three, there's three of those, Robert. National Geographic Whoa. have done two, <laughs> and um, Vice Vice has done one. We've got a locked up abroad episode called Raving Arizona, and wow. then National Geographic last uh, this year just put out. How E busted the bull, how ecstasy busted Sammy the bull, which features my ecstasy ring versus his ecstasy ring. Wow, fantastic. God, I have been waiting. <laughs> It's been waiting Excuse an hour and 45 ignorance. minutes to get this out. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's, he's I'm have to to tell you. Some, I have to go do some research, find your books, and look up these documentaries. Maybe you'll send me some links to do this, but it sounds definitely fascinating, fascinating stuff. We'll, we'll you're like old. a walk you're like walked out of the pages of the 48 laws of power perhaps that's another reason why it resonated so well yeah 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 <laughs> all right then you have a great rest of your day robert this has been an absolute delight can i ask you one question yes do you please. archive this does this show again can people watch it can i send people to a link so this right now is live and it will just keep playing on youtube but what we're going to do is we're going to slice it up into various clips and sections. So we'll have Robert Green on the podcast wars, for example, or you answering various questions and those clips and sections will go out as well over the coming months. Okay. So please send this to it so we can, uh, and get, a, get people here in the States to listen to it. I don't know how many people are watching it live. So. Yeah, we imagine by tomorrow it, it should be in the low tens of thousands. But with the clips, you never know. Some of them can get, get really um, big. Okay. Okay, fantastic. All right. Cheers, then. We wish you all the best. Cheers. And have a Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. Same to Merry you, Christmas, Sean Robert. and Andrew. It's been a pleasure. Merry, Merry Christmas to all of you. And maybe see you in London. That would be lovely. Thank you.